Hey, there's a there's this kind of thing I have actually general fascination, Scott, with names of films, in particular when they're they're, they're translated to another language or from another language. And there's actually a good couple of examples in this this podcast. Uh, I found that when things are translated from Spanish to English or well, French to English, whatever it may be, that uh, for the most part, people try to get like really quite close to the feeling of it. Whereas mm. for some reason, going the other way, there are so many films I've seen translated into, again, French and Spanish, it's the two I'm most familiar with, French and Spanish that just end up like taking all of the fun or the point of the title to come out with the, the, the most perfunctory title you could possibly imagine. Yes. Um, Man with Gun, the movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so there are a couple, a couple in here, like, I'm really curious as to why they changed them when they did. Um, this one is perhaps the, the least of the three examples that we're coming to, but Crimen Perfecto, which is like a corruption of Crimen Perfecto, English, perfect crime, but so in Britain released as the fair pecked crime, hmm. keeping that thing, and it's actually, it's not so important for what actually happens in the film, the name, but you know, it gives you a sense there. Yet, for some reason, released in the United States says the perfect crime, kind of missing the point entirely. And I don't have a point entirely, um, <laughs> it's often, it's often so. Uh, what's that like? Really curious, who makes the decisions for these things and what kind of authority they have or on whose authority they do it and why because they, why do you miss the point so much yeah it, it does not speak highly of the um, american studio's opinion of the intelligence of their audience if nothing else yes yeah, so uh, like, yeah. well i guess at least they think they'd notice it was spelled wrong but it was kind of meant to be <laughs> um yes but uh, yes here at least cuban fair pecto or um, fair pecked crime, Scott. Yes, yes. In which uh, Guillermo Toledo's Rafael Gonzalez has it all, or at least has a plan to eventually get it all. He is the superstar salesman of a Madrid department store, managing the women's clothing department with eyes on a promotion, as well as eyes on every new bell assistant in the store, who mystifyingly find him irresistible. But who am I to judge appearances? Um, anyway, the competition for the promotion turns nasty, and after a mild brawl, his competition, Luis Farella's Don Antonio Fraga is accidentally killed. Now, this crime isn't perfect at all, as Raphael scrambles to cover his tracks. Unexpectedly, he has some help, as the hmm, homely assistant, Lords, uh, Monica Severa, uh, who has been besotted with Raphael for a while. Uh, she helps dispose of the body at the low, low price of blackmailing Raphael into both a relationship and the run of the, run of the floor, having him fire anyone that she dislikes. Well, this can't stand, so Raphael will have to find a way out, even if that means another fair picked crime. Uh, to kill lords, aided by the imagined ghost of Don Antonio, as Raphael's mental state deteriorates. Now, I suppose by this point you're used to the idea of black humour in Alex Inglésia films, and this is no exception. Uh, I found this entirely entertaining throughout, apart from a final act edition of Clowns, which isn't actually terrifying. <laughs> More on this in our next review. Oh uh, yes, there's a whole <laughs> paragraph coming about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I don't think there's much point looking for any broader point or commentary in society here. I think it's just here to have a laugh for an hour and a half-ish and achieve that handily. So I don't think I have a great deal else to say about it other than to recommend it. Um, if you are taking it seriously, I think there's a lot more you could analyse in it, but I, I, I kind of don't. It's too dumb a concept to really read too much into it as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yes, certainly plays into a lot of the uh, tropes of Inglidias' work that you were talking about earlier, uh, Drew. But uh, yes, it's uh, as a film on its own merits, quite entertaining. No real complaints about it. Give it a go. Yeah, uh, this one, I, I didn't even try to find any deeper meaning. This is one that I was pretty confident there wasn't anything in. Yeah. Perdita Durango, I hoped for, but came yeah. to the conclusion there wasn't this one. I kind of thought, no, there isn't, but I found it thoroughly entertaining. I really like um, Willie Toledo. Uh, oh, yes. I... <laughs> he has a great line in outfits later on in the film as well. Which yeah. Is... Um, I mean, I uh, think... Whether it's believable he would get all these women or not, I don't know. But in, I guess nowadays he might be considered a pickup artist, but considerably less sleazy. So um, mm. it's, it's all about confidence, that's how, how he's putting it. But Willie Toledo's great. Uh, I had seen him before in a few things. He's in, do you remember the other side of the bed, Scott? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, he's got um, quite a big role in that. He's one of the stars of that. So I've seen him before. I really like him. He He's very entertaining. Uh, 
I was slightly concerned because well, there's a narration, but in this film it works. It's great, and mm. it's like like within a second or two of the film starting, he's talking directly to the camera. That doesn't always work. It does in this. Uh, he's kind of like the hero of his own story to begin with until it all goes wrong. Um, yeah, I was trying to think of what else it reminded for it reminded me of. It might be is it was it how to get ahead in advertising, a uh, Richard E. Grant film from ages ago, or was, uh, something like that. Is it, there's some other kind of vaguely similar kind of film that kind of reminds me of, but I couldn't quite nail it in my head. But yeah, it works for this film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, he, uh, Willie Toledo's got a lot of charisma, which I mean, mm-hmm. it goes a long way. It, it just works really well. It's it's a ridiculously daft film, mm-hmm. but it's really entertaining and it's full of just. I mean, it's it's got kind of high is not quite the right word, but there's some kind of intellectual humour in there and some really black humour, like the bit when he's talking about the guy that used to be the head of the department, uh, mm. and he's saying uh, he was something special. He had a different blood in his veins. No, literally, he had leukemia, died five months later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and then when he gets injured at the amusement park and there's that little kid just keeps smacking him on the head with a toy hammer. There's a running theme throughout his work that whenever someone falls over, small kids will instantly appear and start beating people with whatever comes to hand. And I'm and, here for it. Yeah, it's very weird, but I am tremendously amused by this. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, as a general rule, I don't care much for for slapstick and physical comedy but for some reason I've always had an incredible weak point for people being hit in the head um, <laughs> and that fits right in there as well as yes. just being wonderfully odd <laughs> I mean it's not a film I think you could say a great deal about it's it's a comedy and it's funny um, yeah. it's, what more do you want yeah. um, well what less do I want less clowns Scott Yes, always less clowns <laughs> It, the, the second half of the film almost feels like a different film because suddenly there, there, there's a green painted ghost zombie murder victim fella <laughs> yeah. it fits right in there didn't bother me in the slightest like, yeah. okay that's there now that's quite funny <laughs> yeah I, again it's it's one of those ones more difficult to talk about because I don't think there's a lot of depth to it it's just a funny film that I enjoyed mm-hmm. less satisfying to discuss in a film podcast perhaps but entirely satisfying to watch uh, what what I would say is, if you've never heard of this uh, Dylan Glazier fellow before, uh, I think this might make a very good entry point um, because it is a bit more flyaway and it does have most of the things that are in all of the rest of his work, but um, in a kind of more generally acceptable level, I think. Yeah, it's slightly um, broader than his other stuff, I would say. Yeah, yeah. So this might be a good place to start with if you if you just want to get into his without um, his canon without getting into the more extreme ends of it, which arguably he started uh, with. Uh, so yeah, this is a nice kind of uh, entry point for it. I would yeah. imagine if, as you say, maybe not the most interesting to talk about, but yeah, it's one of the most easily enjoyable films without uh, any uh, complicating factors to it. Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I do question his choice of exotic car. It's like it's a Peugeot. And it's also, for some reason, 40,000 euros for a Peugeot. Um, I mean, it's yeah. sensible, I guess. But yeah, it's not exactly a dream car. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also weirdly expensive for a Peugeot. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I am very much on a tangent there. But it's just, yeah, it's a good entry point. I would agree with you there. And then if you found you liked that, I would probably direct you towards Day of the Beast next. Yeah. Where you've got still some of that same humour, and the black humour in particular, but with... Um, considerably more bite to it and more heft uh, yes. but yeah it's yes. yeah, definitely a good entry point it's, it's just getting to the point there's not an awful lot more to say about it other than it is funny um, <laughs> what more do you want from me 